Welcome to the EKG Guy if this is your first time. I am so glad you're joining us today. So welcome back if you're returning. Uh, we're going through our EKG coding reference guide, which is online. Okay, so those of you that don't have access, simply put this link in here. Okay, you'll put your email address, click submit. And from that, you'll receive an email. And in that email, there will be a link that you'll click and then you'll have access and that's what will bring you here and you have all these drop down uh, buttons here on the side that gets you into each part of the reference guide so we have gone through part one where we looked at the general features and p wave abnormalities we've gone through all the rhythms sinus atrial uh, ventricular even junctional rhythms we looked at different conduction delays in part three voltage axis and hypertrophy in part four in part five we've gone through bundle branch blocks but we're going to look at one fascicular block today that's called left posterior fascicular block okay so left posterior fascicular block one of the fascicles of the left bundle branch that is blocked and the EKG findings we see with it. All right. Now, if you don't have access uh, to it, make sure you get access so you can follow along. We'll be uploading all the videos there so you can go back and listen to others. In the meantime, you can find them all on YouTube, which are made available to you. Now, if you want to learn more about our courses, our resources and books, go to www.ekg.md. There you can click the EKG course, and we have a number of great options for you that is separate from what you'll find online, okay? And that's what we use to teach our students. So let's get started. So left posterior fascicular block. This is an anatomical or functional dysfunction in that left posterior fascicle of the left bundle branch. And this results in the left ventricular depolarization really relying on that left anterior fascicle. So almost the opposite of what we saw in left anterior fascicular block. So let's just review the conduction system. Remember we have our sinus node up here in our right atrium. This is our right atrium, our left atrium the right ventricle and left ventricle. And so from our sinus node, we have our AV node. We have the His bundle that comes after it. We have a the right ventricle here that's supplied by this, innervated by the right bundle branch, okay? But our focus is gonna be over here in this left ventricle, okay? We have the left bundle branch that comes off initially and then it subdivides into an anterior and posterior fascicle. We're gonna see what happens when this posterior fascicle, and let's say it's this one, gets blocked. So you can imagine the impulse comes down from above and then reaches that block and can't get through, okay? And this is what we're gonna look at, what EKG findings we can see. So if we draw this, um, well, we won't draw it here. Let's just look at the vector changes we see, okay? So hopefully that you understand the conduction system, okay? And then, so if we have a block in this fascicle, what do we see on the EKG? Well, you can imagine that the conduction comes down, okay? Uh, you still have that initial innervation at the septum, and you have this small vector, okay? And this is what we consider a weaker vector, and we're gonna call it vector number one. And the vector is heading in this direction, so we'll call this vector number one. And vector number one is a weak vector, okay? Not as strong as the second one we'll look at. And this one, as you can see, is directed leftwardly as well as superiorly. So leftward and superiorly directed vector, okay? And as a result of that, what leads is it going towards? Well, you have leads AVL here and you have leads one, okay? So because it's going towards those leads, you're going to have what we consider a, a small upright P wave as the depolarization wave heads towards it, okay? And then you're gonna have another vector. And this second vector is gonna go almost in the opposite direction. So away from it, we're gonna call this vector number two. So vector number two is actually a stronger vector, okay? And it's gonna really be the majority of what we see. So in vector number two, what do we see? Well, it's going rightward towards the right side, and it's also going inferiorly. So rightward and inferiorly, okay? So now let's, that we have these two vectors, those are the main vectors that are gonna make the complexes that we see in this block, okay? Uh, let's see what we can see on the KG. So vector one, we said in leads one and AVL, okay? You're gonna have that upstroke, that small R wave from the weaker vector one, 
and let's just uh, let's just put these changes over here so they're not so one and AVL let's look at first so from vector number one you have that small upstroke the R wave and then because vector number two, which is the stronger one, and you have that uh, slow cell-to-cell -cell depolarization heading away from that, you're going to have this deep vector S wave in that lead, okay? So it's going to be something like that, where you have this RS prime, or RS complex in that lead. Now, how about the inferior leads? So two, three, and AVF. Well, in these leads, What's happening? Well, notice that vector one is going away from it. Okay, it's going towards one and AVL, but then it's coming back towards those leads and you're gonna have this sharp upstroke. And as a result, what you see here are QR complexes. Okay, pretty much the opposite of what you see in the lateral limb leads. So again, you are seeing from vector one, a small R waves in the lateral leads Okay, so vector one and a one and AVL. Okay, the small R waves, and then in the inferior leads, two, three, and AVF, you get the small Q waves. Now in vector two, this is the stronger one going rightward and inferiorly, and one and AVL. What do you see? You see the deep S waves that we discussed here, and then in the inferior leads, let's say two, three, and AVF, you see the tall R waves. Okay, so those are the main things we're looking for. Now, another thing I want you to note, so I'm going to erase this here. The other thing I want you to note is that there's right axis deviation. You have this strong vector. Okay, this vector number two is the strong one, and it's heading rightward. And as a result, you get this right axis deviation in the ventricular axis. Okay, so you see a right axis shift in, that, uh, in, uh, in the EKG, and that's actually part of the criteria. So let's just go over this EKG. So leads one and AVL. So this is lead one here. So, where is this? so you can see that. So that's lead one. Notice that you have these RS complexes, RS complexes. So leads one and AVL. So we'll write our criteria here. One AVL RS complexes. And then in the inferior leads, two, three AVF. So let's look at those two, three AVF. Notice that you have mostly these QR complexes. Okay, that will be most uh, significant in lead three. And in the other leads, you can almost see these small S waves that are occurring at the end. The main thing is that QR complex, the big R in the inferior leads and the big S in the lateral limb leads. We also mentioned that there's gonna be a rightward shift. So let's draw our quadrant system. Remember, this is zero degrees, positive 90 degrees, plus or minus 180 degrees and negative 90 degrees. Remember that lead one sits here, this is the positive end, lead AVF is down here, it's positive end. If we look at lead one, which is this here, notice the S wave, deep, it's mostly negative, so it's gonna go away from the positive end of lead one, which is here, so the arrow is gonna go in this direction, away from it. And then if we look at AVF, notice it's mostly positive, it's gonna go towards the positive end of AVF, which puts us in this region here, okay? Now it's actually shifted a little more here. The actual axis was positive 118 degrees, okay? We use between positive 110 and positive 180 degrees for a right axis deviation. We consider more of a rightward shift between positive 90 and positive 110, but once it actually gets between positive 90 and positive 180 in adults, I would, you know, you, you got to start thinking that this may be present, okay? But our criteria here is specifically this, okay, that we use here at Mayo Clinic. Now, the QRS duration, yes, it may be uh, somewhat 
uh, prolonged, maybe because of an underlying uh, intraventricular conduction delay or some aberrant conduction. But really, the cure restoration tends to be within normal limits, okay, less than the three small boxes or 120 milliseconds. Again, in the we have these RS complexes in one and AVL, and the QR complexes in the inferior lead. You have to also rule out other causes of right axis deviation. This is a really important thing. So absence of other causes of right axis deviation, make sure there's no lateral MI, dextrocardia where the heart's on the right side, or right ventricular hypertrophy because you don't want to code them both, okay? If right ventricular hypertrophy is present, you do not code it with uh, the left posterior fascicular block, okay? so. Just make sure you're seeing these things and you have to first rule out other causes before making uh, this code and labeling the EKG with this. Now, the entire left bundle branch conduction system is made up of the left anterior and posterior fascicles, as we discussed. The posterior fascicle supplies the posterior and inferior portions of the left ventricle. It is shorter and thicker than the left anterior fascicle and it receives dual blood supply uh, from both the left and right coronary arteries. And that's why it tends to be more uh, resilient and resistant to any uh, ischemia. And that's why left anterior fascicular block is actually more common than this, okay? So the clinical significance, again, less common than left anterior fascicular block, and that's due to that larger arterial blood supply and the dispersed fibers that make up the left posterior fascicle. This is rare in isolation and often occurs in the setting of a right bundle branch block. Okay, now you may also have heard of this as called left posterior hemi block. Okay, tend to mean the same, but more recently we've been using posterior fascicular block and as the name. So I, if you hear the other one, just be aware. So the criteria we, we mentioned, it's remember these big S waves in the lateral leads, the big R waves um, in the inferior leads, and then also the right axis deviation and rule out other causes of right axis deviation before making this diagnosis. All right, remember it's that vector two that's really causing that strong rightward chip. Well, that's all we have for today, and that's the end of this lecture. I hope you learned something. Now, just to keep you in mind uh, of our course material that we have available, so again, if you go to our website, www.ekg.md, okay? So this is our website. And what you'll notice is that if you go to the EKG course here, okay, you'll find stuff that's separate. So notice that we have a number of topics, practice material, lectures, a way for you to contribute. And this is the course here, over here. So you'll notice we have over 300 videos or so, and that's more on YouTube. There's another 100 more than 100, about 200 videos that are available with the course. So those are separate videos. And this course is really designed to take you from a beginner to advanced interpreter, okay? So completely separate from what you're getting online for free, okay? These are um, course material that comes with it. So notice that you have a book, okay? And then you also have the pocket guide available. So you can choose which format. They are the same thing, both these uh, book and the pocket guide, uh, different formats. Uh, I really like this small one because you can keep it in your white coat if you're in the clinic or in your pocket and it's really available on the go. Now with the book, you also get videos. So notice these are the videos, okay? And these are a video for every single page in that book. So it's over 30 hours of video. Now there's a number of practice material that I continue to upload there. Okay, we'll have practice questions coming soon. Uh, so all of that's available. Again, this is separate from all the free material that you get already. Okay, so this is more high yield stuff. This is what we used to teach our uh, technicians here and our students here at Mayo Clinic. And it's used now among many institutions. So use uh, check that out. Now, what it also includes are calipers. So yes, you get calipers with this course, okay? Um, I don't know anyone else that offers that, but you do get calipers. I think they're very helpful and they can, uh, you know, if you know how to use them correctly, uh, can help to identify different uh, arrhythmias that are going on, okay? And then you also get our pocket 
EKG reference. Okay, this was something we've put together as we were developing course for the fellows. Uh, and this is really nice. It has every code, as you saw earlier, laid out there. Very small pocket guide available. I had help with uh, my colleague, Dr. Peter Noseworthy, who is the head of the EKG lab here at Mayo Clinic, in editing it. So this is something that we use um, and we found very helpful. So go to the EKG course. You'll see examples of lectures, okay, why we developed this, okay. A lot of it came about from myself struggling with learning EKGs, having a father that was an interventional cardiologist and, you know, still struggling. So uh, my struggle is a struggle that I don't want you to have in learning them, okay. You can read all those introductory books, but honestly, they are not uh, enough, okay. And you find yourself using other resources, which is part of the learning process. I wanted to expedite that process for you and make it less uh, inefficient uh, in pretty much what I struggled with going and learning through EKG. So again, from beginner to advanced level with this course, uh, you get the book, the calipers, the coding reference, video access, okay? And now we're offering 25% off. 25% off, put that code in on checkout and uh, you'll have yourself um, 25% off that will even, it's pretty much covers the cost of what we use to print the material. So uh, we don't really make much off it. It's more to help our learners grow and really be able to contribute to patient care. That's why we do this and we love doing it. So thank you so much for your support. Um, if you have any questions, just leave them below and we're happy to answer them. All right. Have a great day.